How's it going? My name's Dim, and in this series, I'll be designing and developing a simple file hosting web app. During the course of this series, I'd really like for you to follow along with me. However, there will be some prerequisites. I will leave some valuable resources in the description to some of my personal favorite study resources. First off, we'll be using Go for the backend. If you're familiar with Go, great, amazing. If you're not, you may follow along anyway in any language of your choosing. With the simplicity of Go syntax, the majority of the code I write should be fairly intuitive, as long as you have some experience programming web servers in any high-level language, using frameworks like Express or Flask. I will be using SQL to store some very basic data. As long as you're at least familiar with the SQL command select and delete, you'll be able to understand what's going on. For the front end, I will simply be using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I hope you have at least a basic understanding in the three. I will be using some newer JavaScript functions like optional chaining, template literals, async await, and arrow functions. There won't be any use of frameworks like React, Vue, Svelte, etc. I want to focus more on the backend and authorization process that goes into making this kind of web app and really any web app. By the end of this, I would like for you to feel comfortable with how to use third-party authorization, how the backend and frontend send and receive large files, and how to design an API. I am by no means an API expert, but I've had lots of years interacting with and creating them, so I've picked up a few things. You will see a lot of googling in this. I want to share what creating an elaborate web app actually looks like, as well as the mistakes and how to troubleshoot them, not just coding. My goal is to expand your set of tools and critical thinking skills in addition to your programming skills. Now, with all that being said, let's go into the details of our file hosting web app, Big Box. Bigbox is a website that allows anyone to upload files from anywhere and share those files with anyone. Really, what I'm aiming for here is a simple service that people can use to share files with others or themselves. I also want these users to have total control over the files they upload, being able to delete them if they choose to do so. So that I don't have to pay for any external services, I'll be storing the images locally. I'll be using the free version of Firebase Auth, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. In this episode, what we're trying to achieve is basic, unauthorized file sending and receiving. Taking a look at our beautiful diagram here, we can see that a user will access the site, which will give them some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. At this point, I was wondering whether I should use a web framework, but decided against it because I felt the build process would be annoying and cause too much distraction throughout the series. I'm trying to stay focused mainly on building the backend. Anyway, when a user visits the site, they should be able to upload an image, which gets sent to the server, stored locally, and added to the database. That entry should then be sent back to the user. Let's start making that now. To start off with, it has been a long, long time since I last made a Go HTTP server. Here I am writing some boilerplate code to get a Jin server running. If you're not familiar with Jin, it's basically an HTTP web server written for Go. It has some awesome routing capabilities, middleware support, and an intuitive and feature-rich API. After writing this code and realizing that I need to run the go get command, I quickly do that and now have Jin installed in my project. Of course, downloading the dependency should be the first thing you do, so don't forget to do that. Now that we have the server running, I want to get a response from it, a hello world at the very least. After reacquainting myself with Jin's API, I start rolling. First, I want to test out a JSON response. I do so by calling the context.json method with the status code of the request and the JSON I want to provide. The Jin.h that you see there is just a map of strings to any type. Mind you, I call it any type, but it's really an empty interface, which is what you use in Go to store any type of value. After getting our version of hello world done, I change the code to do what I actually want, which is to serve an HTML file. A bit of googling leads me to the Jin method router.static, which allows you to statically serve a directory. The first parameter represents the path on the server, and the second parameter is the local path to the directory. I want to store my static files in the folder called static. After writing the line and creating an index.html file, I run the server and check the output. 
just checking that 404 works, and it does. Let's create a form element to upload files. Let's point that to slash API slash upload and use the post method. Inside the form, we need an input for the file and an input button for submitting the form. If you don't want to see them on the same line, you can add a break tag. Testing out our file input, we can see that upon clicking it, we are prompted to choose a file. After choosing a file and clicking the submit tag, you should receive a 404 page. This is because we haven't actually set up the endpoint yet. Let's open up Chrome Developer Tools and inspect the request being sent to the server. First off, we see the form data does not actually include the contents of the file. It only has a file name. This is because we are sending the data using the default content encoding type, which is application slash xwww form URL encoded. This encoding type doesn't allow us to send large files and just emits the contents of the file entirely. We'll come back to that later when the version of me that was coding realizes. Heading over to our server code, we are going to receive and process this request. We do so by using Jin's router.post method, where we can supply a route and a callback method. Jin provides a method under context called form file. This method gives us access to a file header containing information about the file and a reader to get the contents of the file. Because this is in Go, we need to manually check for and handle errors. For now, let's just panic because we are just testing things out. Here, you'll see me using a package called spew. This is a great package for dumping objects and inspecting them in the console. I recommend it for quick object debugging. Now, let's restart the server and test out the post request again. Now is when I finally realized that I need to change the encoding type of the form. After refreshing the page, we see that our request is successful and that we can see the file contents in there as well. Now you can see me changing the way the error handling works and returning a JSON response whenever there's an error. Don't worry too much about this because I end up changing it to context.abort with error in a bit. Although the JSON error response is definitely more useful for the user, continuing to write the server this way would be cumbersome and tedious for this video series. However, if you are ever writing an API that will be used by a lot of people, I 100% recommend returning errors this way, as it allows future developers to figure out the problem without knowing what the backend code looks like. Anyway, now that we have the file header, we can call open on it. Calling open on it returns a file, which is an interface that implements io.reader. We need an io.reader in order to call the method io.copy, which, as you can see, takes a writer as its first parameter and a reader as its second. All this method does is read data from the reader and write it to the writer chunk by chunk, which makes it so that we don't have to store the entire file's contents in memories before writing it. If we did, our application would be heavily limited in how big of a file it can store. Moving on, let's get our writer. We want to store all the files inside a directory. Here, we may create a new directory and a constant variable pointing to that directory. We want to avoid storing the file by the name that was sent in the file header because this may cause collisions in our folder if two uploaded files have the same name. We do this by using a UUID, more specifically a version 4 UUID. The chance of a collision using this strategy is very, 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 very low. This is great for us because collisions are the last thing we want. We can generate using uuid.newString to create a uuid and convert it to a string. Moving on, we are using os.create here to create the new file and filepath.join to join the directory and the uuid. We won't be using any file extensions just to simplify things. I've added a print statement here just to get some information on the files being sent to the server. Here you'll see me discover the context.abort with error method and convert all the previous error checks to that. I've also renamed the two variables to user file and local file just for some readability. Now that we have our reader and our writer, we may begin to use io.copy. Our source is user file and our destination is local file. After all these errors have been checked for, we can finally send the JSON response back to the user.
we are going to send back the generated UUID, the file name, and the file size. Now, let's test out our uploading API. Here, we're going to select the file of our small cute dog and click Go. And voila, the server responds with the generated ID and some file information. Let's go ahead and check out the file to make sure it's been properly stored. We can add back the WebP extension so that VS Code can render the file. And now we see our cute puppy. Now, we want to be able to see our file from the web. To do this, we will create a new endpoint that accepts GET requests. Here I decide to get rid of the slash API in our paths because when a user views the image, I don't want them seeing API in the path. This is just a personal preference thing. Anyway, the new GET endpoint will take a parameter called ID. What this slash files slash colon ID does is accept any request that begins with slash files and is followed by a string. This allows us to dynamically take requests to this endpoint and decide what we want to do with the fields in the URL. Before we can get the files, we need them to be stored somewhere. For now, let's just store the file data in memory. To do that, we have to create a file struct. This struct will have a field for the ID, the file size, file name, and the content type. Now we have to figure out how to get all these fields. I have a feeling that the file type is stored in the content type header, but I want to check first. Going back to our post request, we are going to dump the contents of the headers. Restarting our application to test that out, we have an unexpected error. It turns out that using router.static on the root of the site causes issues when trying to use paths with parameters later on. After some tinkering around, I found out that the method we actually want is a middleware called static.serve. Copying this line from Stack Overflow, I restarted my server and everything works just as I intended. Now, let's store the files in our memory for later retrieval. Before that, let's just throw in some JSON tags so that the JSON serializer can use conventional API field names. Now, let's create a global variable called db that holds a slice of files. For those who aren't used to Go, a slice is just an array that doesn't have a fixed size. This is where we'll add and look up files. It isn't the fastest method, but that's okay because we'll be changing it soon. You'll notice that I make a last minute decision and change the slice to a slice of pointers. This is to make appending slightly faster and prevent any copying of data. Now that we've got that, let's go back to our post request callback and instantiate the file struct. Here you can see me use a VS Code Go plugin feature to fill all the fields automatically. Now we can include our ID, our file size, our file name, and the type of the file. I realized that size should actually be an int and not a string, so I went back and changed that. You'll see that we retrieve the type of the file using the header.get method on the file header. After instantiating this struct, let's add it to the DB and send it to the user. Now, let's head over to the get callback that we created and retrieve the file from the database. To find it, we must loop over the files in the database and find the one with the same ID as the ID parameter in the request. At first, I use context.mustget by accident but this method returns the value of the data stored in the request context, which is filled by middleware and not by the URL. Once the file is found, we serve the JSON of the file data and return from the loop. If the loop reaches the end and no file is found, we send a 404 error. Testing the code out, I realized that must get failed since it's not the method I actually wanted. After a quick Google search, I realized I really wanted to use context.param, so make sure the same is reflected in your code as well. Finally, we test out the endpoint again, and now we can see our file data from the in-memory database. That's great, but it's not what we really want. What we want is to get the actual file and not just data about the file. Heading back to our backend code, we comment out the JSON line and make a call to context.file. At first, I thought I needed to use context.file from fs, but I did not. After finding the file method in the docs, I used that method instead. One important thing we must do is provide the user with the type of the file. If we don't, the browser will not properly render it. Here we can set the content type header to the content type we stored earlier. Testing that out, it seems to work pretty well. We can see our cute puppy in the browser, but there is still one problem, and that is that the name of the file is not being sent. This part is optional, but I personally like to be able to download the file and preserve the original file name. To do this, we must set the content disposition header's file name parameter. After a quick Google search to find the MDN page on it, I try implementing it in my code. Testing that out, 
we see that now when we try to save the file on Chrome, it does in fact preserve the original name. There is still one issue, since we are not sanitizing the file name and wrapping it in quotes. Meaning that if the file name contains any special characters, this may break the HTTP request or even lead to a vulnerability in the server. To avoid this, we must sanitize the user input and wrap it in quotes. After a bit of googling to see how others have tackled this problem, I find a very useful stack overflow answer where a string replacer is being used to replace a backslash with double backslashes and quotes with escaped quotes. After integrating that into my code, it seems to work just great. Here you can see me testing out file names with quotes in them, but this is when I realized that I still have a slight issue. It seems that our header.file name contains URL query escaped characters. To unescape them, we must use goes url.query unescape method. This method has a chance of erroring, so we can't just one-line it. Finally, with all that done, let's run one final test. The name in the JSON looks as I intended. When viewing and attempting to save the file, the file name seems to be a little weird, since it has replaced the quote with an underscore. But I believe this is just something Chrome does that we can't avoid. Checking the request headers just to confirm, everything looks in order to me. Anyway, I think that's a great stopping point. As a quick recap, we have set up a basic HTML form for submitting files, a Go web server that accepts files, saves them locally, and the file data in memory. This server is also able to return them to the user, preserving the file's content type and name. This is a great start, but I would prefer to store the file data in an actual database and not just in memory. So we will be tackling that in the next episode. Anyway, thank you for watching, and until then, stay tuned and peace out.